Uh, hello and welcome to our monthly meeting of the Central Banking and Digital Currency Series. Today we will have a panel discussion on whether central banks should issue digital currencies. Today's host is the ECB, and I will now turn things over to our moderator today, Katrin Asimako. Hello, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'm Katrin Asenmacher. I'm heading the uh, Monetary Policy Strategy Division at the ECB. And I'm very honored to welcome three very distinguished speakers to this panel today. And let me briefly introduce them, although I'm sure that everybody knows them. So there is not no need to say a lot of words. So let me start with Governor Chris Waller, who is um, Governor at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System since uh, December 2020. And prior to his appointment at the board, Dr. Waller served as an executive vice president and director of research at the Federal Bank of St. Louis since 2009. And well, I think it's well known that the Federal Reserve System is not very enthusiastic about uh, central bank digital currencies. And and I think that's also reflected in Chris' um, recent speeches, where he has a speech that's titled uh, CBDC, a solution in search of a problem. So I'm looking forward to, to hear your views about that. And then I would like to turn over to Gary Gordon, who is the Frederick Frank class of 1954 professor of finance at Yale School of Management. And Dr. Gordon has done a lot of research in many areas of finance and economics, including both theoretical and empirical work. He has also consulted uh, for various central banks, among them the Federal Reserve Bank, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan. And uh, Professor Gordon has published on stablecoins, uh, mainly being critical about stablecoins. And this has also been reflected in uh, media coverage. For example, the Financial Times has titled uh, Gordon turns his attention to stable coins. So um, I'm sure that we will hear a lot about uh, stable coins and regulating stable coins and the, the distinction between public and private money from you. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Hyung Song Chin, who is an uh, economic advisor and head of research at the Bank for International Settlements. And Hyun, of course, is at the center of um, digital currencies and uh, central bank. Um, advice on digital currencies. And um, I think, so let me directly start uh, with you. And so we have many developed um, economies that are exploring that central bank digital currencies, uh, which means that they public, the general public would have direct access to central bank money, digital central bank money. In particular, Federal Reserve, Bank of England and ECB have also launched consultations to seek feedback from the public on topics related to CBDC. So Hyun, what are the benefits in your view of a central bank digital currency and why would a central bank want to offer it? Well, thank you, Catherine. It's, um, it's great to join you and, uh, and the other panelists on this, on this really good, um, uh, in this really good discussion. I, I did have a couple of slides, which actually might uh, help us to save a bit of time. I won't uh, you know, go through all of them, but I thought it was um, um, maybe interesting just to uh, you know put the discussion in a in a, in a broader context, um, and um, I think one very important theme um, is the is the broader um, uh, you know market structure uh, in the monetary and payment system that I think uh, a CBDC uh, you know designed in the right way would actually provide you, and. Uh, you know, before we get to CBDCs, think about uh, the conventional two-tier system. You know, we have the the central bank um, providing the the settlement accounts uh, as a metaphorical public square, and the idea is that within this public square, intermediaries, whether they be banks uh, or in some other uh, jurisdictions other than the U.S., even non-banks, could be offering payment services. And um, if you combine, uh, you know, this sort of setting where you have a digital ID system uh, that is well established, uh, you know, everyone is using their real names. And at the same time, you, uh, you combine it with, um, you know, the technical standards uh, for information exchange, for privacy, uh, for example, through the various application programming interfaces, APIs, so-called, that give you, um, you know, this, uh, um, 
the, the ability to transact uh, by just sending just the right amount of information uh, and sending information to only those who actually absolutely need to know it uh, and thereby preserving privacy, but at the same time, opening up the whole payment system to, uh, to competition. So, um, you know, why am I bringing this up? Well, I think we should be, you know, thinking about a CBDC, especially a retail CBDC, as um, some, by analogy with this kind of system where you have an open architecture and you have the, uh, um, the wherewithal to prevent uh, walled gardens, but rather impose from the very outset uh, an open architecture. Um, now, the, the way that I've just uh, described this, this is really um, how a, a retail fast payment system uh, would work. Now, the payments are in terms of uh, deposits or other claims on the intermediary. So these are not CBDCs, but it's a very short step from this kind of architecture uh, to a CBDC in the sense that the, the same um, information, uh, the same data architecture that has digital IDs and APIs. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what you'd expect uh, to, to have in a, in a CBDC based framework. And I would go so far as to say, if you have something like this already, a retail fast payment system, you are 70% of the way there towards a CBDC in that uh, you, know, you have most of the, uh, of the infrastructure there um, uh, you know, already in place. The one additional step would be that you're transacting in the direct claims. Um, now, let me get uh, back to that. But what, what are, the, um, what are the, some of the you know, benefits of having an open system like this? And I guess uh, you know, in, in this context, we're really talking about something like FedNow rather than uh, a CBDC. But let me just give you a couple of um, facts and figures for um, a very interesting example from Brazil. I just tweeted this out yesterday, and it uh, seems to be getting some traction, um, you know, out there and on on Twitter. Um, Brazil actually launched this instant payment system in November 2020. It's exactly this kind of system where you have a digital ID and you have APIs uh, that ensure this open architecture. The Central Bank of Brazil is both the infrastructure provider as well as the rule setter. It actually oversees the rules uh, um, on, on uh, you know, how uh, the fees are set, how uh, the, the interactions and the, um, the payments between intermediaries actually happen. If you think about how, uh, how an instant payment system works, what you need is basically uh, when I press a button on my phone, the money immediately appears on the phone of the person that I'm sending it, even though uh, the other person is a customer of another bank. So it's a different intermediary, but then you know, this claim you know, is, is instantaneously transferred. What would you need to do that? Uh, you know, what would you need for that to happen? Well, you need the central repository of digital IDs and the APIs, which mean that uh, you, know, you can ensure this interoperability between intermediaries. And also the privacy, which means that you know, uh, even though I'm um, uh, a part of this system using my real name, uh, so it's not like Bitcoin, but I'm just using my private keys, I'm using my real name, but my identity and my transaction uh, is masked from everyone except for you know, those people who actually need to see it. Now, what's happened in Brazil is that you know, this system was launched in uh, November 2020. And since then, it's been over just over a year now, They've signed up uh, uh, two thirds of Brazil's adult population, and uh, um, it's been a you know really a, a really very very um, you know rapid adoption. And um, this is a chart that really strikes um, the message home. If you think about the way that this particular system is now um, bedded in, and you count the number of transactions uh, within the space of just over a year, it's uh, you know it blew past prepaid cards. Uh, in a few months, and now it's um, just poised to overtake debit and credit cards. Um, and you can but imagine if that- I can, If I can ask you a question, you, you sure. said that um, the, um, with an instant payment system, you have about 70% of uh, what a CBDC is doing. And I think the last 30% is that uh, an instant payment system, it's still money that's a liability of a Exactly. entity and not money that's liability of the central bank. So I think one key question is um, 
where the citizen should be able to uh, pay with central bank money in an increasingly digital world. And uh, so many developed economies have already fast payments uh, systems. So yeah. I guess the main sticking point is, uh, do citizens need to pay with central bank money when the uh, commerce and everything is becoming increasingly digital? So uh, maybe also the other panelists, for example, Chris, you are Federal Reserve official. What is your view on that? Oh, you are still on mute. Chris, you're muted. Sorry, I just want to check. Are we going back to Hoon or are we now changing the structure of this conference? We're now moving on to other things. I just want to double check. I, I think we, we should move on. So we have already 10 minutes into our time and I think um, we probably should have a bit more of discussion and the action as uh, okay. discussed. So, I think, yeah, maybe Hyun will disagree, so sure. feel free to. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the first thing I have to say is what I say are my views and not the views of the Federal Reserve. I have colleagues who have very different views than I have on uh, CBDC. So, I mean, the critical thing that, that Hyun was pointing out is you have to separate payment systems from what the instrument is. Because you're going to have fast payments and it's all commercial bank money and everybody's happy with the way that works. And the prices are fairly cheap for that. Uh, so that, that getting to faster payments has nothing to do with the CBDC. So the way I kind of have phrased thinking about a CBDC, at least for the U.S., I, I'm just going to speak for the U.S. experience, is that the Fed's charged with make, ensuring the safety and efficiency of the U.S. payment system. For 100 years, we have taken the position that we will stay in the background and do all the settlement clearing across the banks, and we'll let the banks do the front-facing direct interaction uh, with the uh, customers or the private citizens. With the CBDC, at, at least a retail, you're now asking more, now an intermediate, intermediated CBDC is slightly different, but if you thought about a direct access one, you're saying, should the Fed take a more forward role in processing payments for consumers and households and firms and sidestep the banks? Okay, that's a philosophical question. And so, as I've said before, when I think about the government's role in the private markets, I always try to think what externality or what market failure is there that would require us to move away from a hundred year tradition and adopt a retail CBDC. So for me, that's the big question. Point that out to me. Uh, too often I see research papers on CBDC that look like infomercials. What does an infomercial do? It says, I'm gonna tell you all the wonderful things this product does. It slices, it dices, it minces, it mashes. And the whole idea is to keep you from asking, do I really need this thing or want it? And that's what I've been trying to focus things back to why do we really need it as opposed to look at all the bells and whistles that come along with it? And I haven't been convinced of that yet. It's not saying that I can't be, but I haven't seen that on a retail CBDC. Um, so I'll just kind of stop there and let others jump in. Well, I guess one point is that um, commercial bank money comes with a lot of regulation. So you need a lot of regulation to keep the uniformity of a unit of account. And um, you, uh, CBDC could probably be one option that you can do with less regulation by having kind of a digital anchor or digital um, means of payment that access is accessible to everybody. And um, yeah, so maybe Gary can say something on- Yeah, let me say something things. because we've wandered off into the weeds without really thinking about the real questions. I don't think we're Brazil. I don't think this is about retail payments. So let, let, me, let me start with a couple of fundamental things which we ought to talk about. One is that 100 years ago, 150 years ago, every single country on earth decided that the sovereign should have a monopoly over money creation, okay? So we haven't had to think about that. Now we have stable coins, which are competitors for government money. So you can, you can throw up your hands and say, let's let stable coins happen. 
But we asked this question 100 years ago, and we decided that for financial stability reasons, and now we would add for monetary control reasons, we would like the, the sovereign to have a monopoly over money, okay? So whether it's retail or wholesale or whatever, that's the first question. Do we want financial stability, right? So let me give you a fact. If the top three stable coins issuance goes up by one standard deviation, commercial paper issuance the next day goes up by 7%. So we're not talking about some abstract thing here. We're talking about the money market is already influenced by stable coins. That's the first thing. The second thing is everybody now knows what SWIFT is. And SWIFT was, as you know, central to the Russian sanctions. And it was used before the Treasury got data and presumably the national security agencies got data so we could track terrorist money and so on. Now, every other central bank on earth and in the developed economies has cross-border experiments with CDCs, right? To understand how this is going to work, how the interoperability is gonna work. And it's gonna take five or 10 years. We're not having anything soon. But it's going to be important to understand that we're not going to be using SWIFT. We're not going to have messages. We're going to actually move money through blockchains. And that means this whole issue is a national security issue. It's a national security issue. And if, if we, the U.S., is not involved in setting the standards of understanding how this has worked because we think that's a retail thing, then we're going to be really behind. So I don't think I don't th this is much bigger than the Fed. The Fed can think whatever it wants. It's going to happen with the Fed or without the Fed. And the question is whether we're going to be involved and so we can understand the standards, which we're going to need for national security reasons. Those are the questions. We're not Brazil. So, Gary, let me. So, current systems, they're all pegged to the dollar. The, they're, nobody's saying that the Fed is not going to be the individual issuing a sovereign unit of account. It's just no, everything's pegged to point. that. You're missing the point. We're not going to be using paper. We're not going to be using paper. I, I don't care about paper. I, can I care about paper because object. everybody else is using blockchain. That's the that's the technology for recording things, not the object itself. No, that's right. That's right. But we're not arguing about the object itself. We're arguing about the technology. So, I, I, so first of all, I think blockchain is totally overrated. Well, you can we live in a, we live in a world. Already happening. Live, I know it's already happened. But the question is. Is it the most efficient way to do stuff? We know that distributed ledger blockchain is one way of doing transaction, transactions and record keeping. It's not efficient. No, it's not claiming it's efficient. It's got issues. It's got scalability issues. It's got interoperability issues. Right. And it's a very, very early days. My point is, if we don't learn about it in the very early days, we're going to be behind. We're going to be behind. We're already behind. And... It not, we're not going to get a blockchain-based central bank digital currency for five or 10 years. That's certainly the case. But in every other case where there's cross-border trade, which is what we're talking about, there have been conventions, international conventions, which determine, for example, insurance liability. And those are, you know, those are treaties between countries. So all I'm saying is, if we don't learn, I'm, I'm advocating learning which the Fed doesn't need an act of Congress to do, it can actually learn, presumably. And I think that's what we should be doing. Other central banks are already learning. The Fed, the Fed is not learning. And so that's why the national security folks are kind of upset, right? I'm, can I say baffled. I'm totally baffled by that statement. Well, you, I, you better I'm check totally baffled White how House. you can make that statement. The, president, the president's uh, executive memo basically says that between the lines. All I know is the amount of resources that we have studying this and researching it and understanding it is pretty big. So yeah. to say we're behind, is, we don't understand what blockchain is. Are you no, serious? I'm saying that every other every other developed country central bank has a cross border experiment. And fake doesn't Hewan doesn't the BIS isn't the BIS involved in one? Yeah. Uh, so um, so uh, Gary, if I can get a word in edgeways here, can I just say something about this? Uh, Far away. <laughs> It off the, I think we've sort of veered off the topic a bit, uh, but, but can I bring it back to uh, Chris's question earlier, which is, uh, you know, are CBDCs, so let's first of all distinguish retail CBDCs from wholesale CBDCs. I think, I think the uh, question is not and, retail. We're, you're talking about the design before we've even decided whether in principle the sovereign should be a monopoly sure. issuer of money. You're yeah, skipping yeah. a few steps. 
absolutely no 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 uh, let's but let's make sure that we we touch all the bases um what i was about to say was uh, and i think brazil is a, actually a very good uh, it's actually a very interesting ex, um experiment uh, gary i think i think it is worth looking at no i agree um, with chris but, on this then it's then it's you know a problem in search of a solution right we we don't have such a terrible retail system in the us granted china is faster and in Sweden, Swish is faster. None of these things work cross border, by the way. But I don't think that's the issue. I think for developed countries, it's about global supply chains, right? That's the issue, right? Global supply okay, chains so, are already um, using blockchain. Let me, let me make a couple of points, Gary. So uh, first of all, um, if you don't already have a retail fast payment system, uh, then that's probably the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and I think you know, with with FedNow that's uh, that is coming in next year. I think that is uh, you know, uh, uh, for, that's going to be a very important development um, uh, that uh, you know will be you know setting a you know very important benchmark. Now, uh, Chris, you could easily um, you know from there you can say what in addition do you gain from a CBDC? And I think here this um, this goes to some of what Gary uh, is is referring to. I think there's a general point here, which says uh, when we think about the monetary system and think about policy uh, for the next five to 10 years, um, we should be really trying to anticipate uh, what that, uh, you know, what the system will look like, uh, what the technology might, you know, enable you to do five to 10 years from now, rather than, um, you know, looking backwards and saying, you know, do we need it right now? Now, the second point, and I think this is where the blockchain and the decentralization uh, comes in. Um, Jun, when you, Jun, if this is your best case for a CBDC, I agree yeah. with Chris. When you have an international system, um, uh, you know, uh, by definition, by, by the nature of the problem, you have more than one currency. And if you have more than one currency, you have more than one central bank. And uh, in, the, uh, in the international um, uh, application, uh, you know, rather than going through uh, the long chains of corresponding banks, if you want to use a CBDC architecture, then, uh, you know, by the nature of the problem, you need decentralization uh, from word go. Um, and Gary, you, you, you refer to the, uh, to the BIS experiments. Let me say, just, just say, you know, one, one word on that. Um, you know, we have three experiments going on at the moment uh, that has uh, these multi-CBDC type, uh, you know, collaborative experiments going on. One is this uh, project called Jura, and it's run out of our Switzerland center in the BIS Innovation Hub. It's between the Swiss National Bank and the Banque de France. So we have the Swiss franc and the Euro as being the two currencies. Now, what do we need to do in this kind of international setting? Um, we can't use blockchain here because the, by, uh, you know, by construction, blockchain actually has everything up uh, on the block. And because we want to use real names, yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, almost by, uh, you know, from the word go, we, we, you know, we want to use real names. This is why I was uh, um, uh, going into digital IDs and APIs. We have to use real names rather than private keys uh, because it's but a you fundamental. Can do that. People have discussed how you do that on blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's, all, there's so several proposals about how you do that. A non blockchain DLT. How do you have a non blockchain DLT? Well, uh, you know, you have real names. You still have decentralization, uh, but the uh, but the unspent transactions are coded through a chain, you know, just like in the public key cryptography. But you keep track of the unspent balances, um, but it but it's uh, done through uh, these non-blockchain DLT. So that's one experiment we're doing. We have another experiment that's uh, um, coming out of Singapore. It's called Project Dunbar. There's another group of central banks there. Uh, that's a group of uh, um, uh, central banks, both in the region and and, and outside, um, but uh, the uh, technology is very very similar in that uh, you know we're using real names, and this is wholesale. So the uh, the members uh, of the nodes are commercial banks across the different jurisdictions, and we need central banks there as nodes of this decentralized uh, of of the system. Now, the variations have to do with how do you take care of AML. Uh, do you need a sponsor bank in each jurisdiction that, that you have to go through to transact in that currency? Or do you allow commercial banks to hold directly claims of other central banks? There's a 
there's a simple, you know, there is a variation in Hong Kong. Uh, the difference between the one in Hong Kong, which we call Embridge, the one in Singapore we call Dunbar, is that in Dunbar we have this additional AML layer that actually, you know, uh, allows the, you know, the, you know, the additional check. So I'm actually agreeing with you, Gary. Um, so for the, um, you know, for the question, and Chris, you you pose that question. If you already have a well-functioning retail CBDC, so if you already have a well-functioning retail fast payment system. What in addition do you gain by going to a CBDC? Well, one of the answers is that you're actually future-proofing the system to the case when you eventually go to a multi-currency CBDC system, rather than going through this very long chain of uh, um, correspondent banks. You can have a much more parsimonious monetary architecture where you have central banks that uh, are uh, that will oversee the, the settlement in a particular currency. So but I, then you, let me just interrupt you. Them. I mean, I yeah, agree but, with Chris. If know, this is your best case, then this is a lot of hoo-ha. I think the best case has to do with global supply chains and cross-border stuff. It's not retail. I mean, the U.S. system is not so bad. So this is the wholesale system that I'm talking about. So the, so the nodes in the decentralized network, these are commercial banks. So, um, I, so I think we are now moving very much into a very technical aspects of, of the discussion. So, and if I understand you right, you, you're saying that um, uh, CBDC is improving the efficiency of cross-border transactions. And I think there is no disagreement between you and Gary that this is something that needs to be explored. But I, I would have a different question to Chris. Uh, for example, if there were a foreign CBDC could this challenge the status of the US dollar in your view? And is there a first mover advantage regarding CBDC issuance? So we know that the Chinese are very advanced. So other central banks are also doing CBDC pilots. So do you think that those central banks are probably having a first mover advantage uh, in being issuing an international currency? So if, again, if we're gonna talk about retail CBDC, I'm gonna focus my comments on that. I mean, what has the PBOC done? They've allowed Chinese households to have a bank account with the PBOC so they can pay their electric bill. That's it. That's all they've done. So I always have a puzzle as to how allowing Chinese citizens to either use Alipay, WeChat, or the PBOC threatens the international status of the dollar. This is a mystery to me how this works. Now, I could certainly envision how a retail direct access CBDC at the Fed could threaten currencies in other countries if you allowed foreigners to have accounts at the Fed. There'd be such a crush of demand for these accounts that other governments and other central banks would have a problem. But I don't see how having payment accounts at a central bank threatens the dollar in any way, shape or form. Now, if you were to go to a wholesale CBD where it's in a particular country and somebody doesn't lag and all firms get onto a platform that will take that CBDC as the payment, yeah, then I could see something like that being a concern. But I certainly don't see it with re to any kind of retail payment CBDC. I agree with that. Actually, I actually agree with that. I, I think Chris has, a, has it exactly right. Uh, you know, what is a retail CBDC? It is ultimately, <laughs> a, yeah, it's a ledger that the central bank, um, uh, well, it, depending on the, on the ex you know, depending on the design, um, uh, and the one in China is exactly this design, it's a ledger that the central bank maintains, and it's a, it's a record of who pays what to whom. Right. Uh, now, uh, one of the consequences of doing it that way is that uh, uh, to be able to use the CBDC, to use the ECNY, you have to be allowed onto that network. So, um, it, you know, it, it, in order to be able to transact in, in ECMY, you have to be a member of that. And therefore you have to have, uh, you know, be on the list of the people, uh, you know, uh, between which you can actually transact. So it's not like uh, briefcases full of cash that's circulating in a black market. So I think that's the first thing to say. I think the, the, um, uh, the much more uh, plausible scenario, uh, and this is something that emerging markets <clears throat> of course, do worry about, um, and especially with regard to uh, cryptoization, 
I think much more plausible would be a, a private sector player, a stable coin, for example, uh, as Gary mentioned. And the onboarding of customers is done uh, you know, through a purely uh, private service provider uh, that does not have, uh, um, uh, and if it uh, operates and straddles across borders uh, and it operates in a global currency, I think that's much more likely to lead, and that's a, a scenario that is much more conducive, if you like, to the encroachment of um, a, uh, a foreign provider uh, encroaching on, uh, you know, on your monetary system. So I think with CBDCs, if anything, uh, you're actually building in safeguards um, against the, um, the monetary encroachment in the sense that, first of all, the issuing central bank has to give you permission to use it outside that jurisdiction. And secondly, this is where you know, central banks uh, who can cooperate uh, uh, you know, within uh, you know, uh, institutions like the BIS can actually make sure that we have monetary cooperation uh, between central banks where the system works for the public interest. I think stable coins, which you mentioned, Hyun, are really the relevant thing here, right? Because that's the competition. If right. stable coins end up being used, I mean, right now there's not much use for stable coins. You can lend it out to somebody can take a levered position in Bitcoin or something, but it's early days and they're already very large and they affect the commercial paper market, for example. So I, I think the issue is the one I said, you know, we tried to solve a hundred years ago. If stable coins, you know, become much more widespread and they have much more um, uses, then we, then we, I think we have a problem. I think the Fed has a problem and it, you know, it's, it's already, I think, kind of going towards a financial stability problem, right? I mean, it's not very big yet. It's about 200 billion outstanding. Uh, but it's, you know, all these issues that Chris mentioned at the beginning, scalability, interoperability, these things are, are being worked on and it's changing really fast. And I, I venture to say that the stablecoin lobbying group is already very powerful. The president's working group report on stable coins didn't even mention the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is that, you know, this is going to be a rival for the government's money. So that the stable coin money is not going to be a retail product, right? It's going to be a, a, a global supply chain product where they're already using NFTs and they just need something to pay, right? And they could pay with cash, you know, but there's all sorts of interoperability problems because none of these guys are linked to the current payment system. And the Fed doesn't want to let anybody in. They have, you know, they pulled up the gates so that no new kind of bank uh, can even have a limited, you know, access to a, a master account. Uh, so I think, I think, you know, a lot of this is going to be dictated by stable coins and stable coins have nothing to do with this retail stuff. I agree with Chris, the retail stuff is a red herring. Well, let, let me, let me, so there is, there was one very, so first of all, when we talk about a stable coin, most of these things peg themselves to the dollar, at yeah, least the yeah. ones in the US. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're not threatening the US dollar or, or Fed authority or monetary reach at all any more than a commercial bank does with commercial bank money. No, I think it goes this, to your earlier point, Chris, that if they start to be used in international transactions, um, then the question is, there's a financial stability issue. It's mostly about a financial stability issue when they get- Gary, there. which ones are you, I mean, I, I think we have, to, we have to distinguish between the stable coins that are the poker chips in the DeFi and crypto world. Right. No, no, forget the about DeFi. That, uh, We're we talking about the top uh, three stable uh, coins. When we talk about, um, uh, you know, retail use. You know, there was the Libra, uh, you know, later, uh, you know, there was a Libra and DM um, proposal, which, uh, you know, which was very much this, uh, you know, this retail use case. But I think that's now receded. Um, so um, I, I just want to understand which state, you know, which type of stable. I'm talking about the top three stable coins, which are Tether, USD, USC. Yeah, so those are and those, those three coins right now have, you know, they have an inconvenience yield. Right. Yeah. They're not they're not really useful in many ways. So but those it's are not that they're a threat yet. But those are crypto. But, you know, those are used for transactions mainly on the on, uh, you know, DeFi. for crypto applications, you know, whether it's for whether it be for DeFi. Yeah, no, I know that. I know that. Hyun. I'm yeah. saying I'm saying that this 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 space is going to grow and 
the issues that we all, all are aware of that these guys have, they're working on, right? I mean, you're, 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 in the world, you're in the world of say 1970 where there was 300 different internets and they weren't connected. And you could say, well, why do we need them connected? And I, you know, I say, well, we might have email. What's, why do we need email? We can yeah, write I, letters. Uh, can you just right? sketch out that scenario for us? Um, so so um, uh, are you saying that cryptocurrencies will displace conventional money? No, no, I, wait a minute. First of all, I'm not talking about cryptocurrencies. I'm talking about stable coins. Suppose, but the, suppose but the stable coins you've just mentioned are the primary, are the, you know, the exchange media in the cryptocurrency world. Yeah, but right now it's in the cryptocurrency world. The question is, when, when, when it's not in the cryptocurrency world, then what? Yeah, so that so I'm, I'm wondering gonna... a little bit, uh, what, what do you precisely mean by financial stability issues? So I think in the context of CBDC, people are concerned that bank deposits can walk away to, from the commercial banks okay, to forget, a CBDC about or to a stable stuff. coin. But it seems to me that you are more um, concerned about uh, working of the money market and the, the reserve side of stable coins. So, so right? no, I mean, I, mean I, I just want to set this retail stuff aside for a moment, okay? This is like, I, I think, I think Hyun kind of, kind of got off on the wrong track. So it's very so important. As Chris yeah. pointed out, stable coins, you know, are allegedly pegged one for one. And their terms of service say that you know, you can go back and redeem them for dollars one for one. So it's basically short-term debt. You know, it's true that you can't do very much with this stuff now, but it's also true that, you know, 92,000 computer scientists are working on these various issues. And so we'll see where it goes. The fact that it's short-term debt means that it's vulnerable to runs. And uh, the problem is that if it's never interoperable with the current payment system, you know, it has a limitation that, again, you have to overcome somehow, uh, these stablecoin guys. So my, my point earlier was that we ought to learn about this so that we're in a position to understand what the standards should be for, for the projects that Hyun was talking about, the experiments, because at some point, the central bank is going to say, are, are these guys a competitor for us? And the reason that 100 years ago we decided to have monopoly over money is for financial stability reasons. I guess regulation is one way to address this uh, issue. And uh, a CBDC would probably be another way. But I think there is much less agreement on, on CBDC than on regulation. So, Chris, what's your view on, on that? Well, like I said, on the stable coin, I, my question I always try to ask myself first is, what is the business model that the issuer has in mind? So Gary's talking about ones that basically look like money market mutual funds and issue a token that gets traded for a variety of payments. The alternative is the Facebook DM model, which is they're not interested in any kind of debt or interest arbitrage. They just want to take this thing they would be happy with the following. Give me a dollar, I'll put it in a Fed master account, and then I'll issue you a DM to use on the Facebook network. Perfectly safe. There's no runnable problem with that. They want your information. They want your financial transaction information. That's what they're going to monetize. So that's a completely different concept of a stable coin than what Gary's talking about with a kind of a mutual fund approach. Well, it's not a mutual fund. It's, it's a debt contract. But I agree with you, Chris, when you say, if you said to me, what's their business model? The answer is, I don't think they really know yet. Right. They don't, they don't know, right? They're, and in fact, many of these issuers, Circle and Paxos, I mean, if you look at their websites, they're doing 9 billion different unrelated things, right? And I think, I think the reason they don't, don't really know what their business model is. Um, you know, and all of these, the top three stable coins all trade at the same price and they all move together. So despite their efforts to kind of differentiate themselves in various ways, they have not been successful. The market just views them as all one big stable coin. So right, right now, I mean, their business model, they don't- But isn't that a good thing, Gary? No, I, well, I'm not sure because I, I would prefer that if there's a run, it's a run on you know, one of these stable coins, not on all of them, right? And right now the run would just be, we sell them and the price would go to zero. So I'm not, I'm not worried about, you know, a financial stability issue right now, I'm worried about it in the future. 
And I'm also worried about this national security stuff in the future. It's not, you know, none of these things are going to be an issue for us until it's too late. That's what I'm mainly worried about. To Gary, I think uh, I would just I think it's a good. I think it's a good time to open up uh, for, for also for questions from the floor. And there is one question which is really very close to what we were just discussing. It's from Callum Levington. And he asks, uh, do you think that crypto in its current form poses financial stability risks? And if so, would a CBDC be a potential solution to this? So I think we haven't touched on the second part. So what so there's CBDC no there's no risk help? now. There's no there's no risk now. The, the question is whether there's anything we should do now because we see that there may be risks in the future. And, you know, it's not the reason that governments decided to have a monopoly over money was because of financial stability concerns with privately issued money. But we're not at that point yet. Yeah, I would say that, look, most of these cryptocurrencies, these are not payment instruments at all. These things, my view is these things are just electronic gold. They're forms of storage carrying wealth across time. Look at art, look at baseball cards, look at all of this stuff that's intrinsically useless that people pay a lot of money and they hold on to because they think they can sell it later and get their money back. No, the but that's, I agree with you stuff. about all that, about NFTs and Bitcoin, but I don't think that's really the issue. The issue is stable coins. That's the issue. And the well, issue the question was, was about crypto. Well, crypto, we don't care about. So tell, say that to the audience. <laughs> we don't care about that. There's the answer. Right. It's a stupid question. Take it back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it is, as you say, digital baseball cards and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I have another question, which is related. And this question is, why would a USD denominated stablecoin be any different from current commercial bank money? So why would it be a threat on the scale mentioned? Simply regulated appropriately and it shouldn't be really a threat. So it's a question by Scott Hendry. So I paper agree. is different than digital stuff. It's the first answer to the first question. And, you know, it could be regulated, uh, but, you know, it, it does, that doesn't address the financial stability concerns unless we're going to start insuring it all. Which I don't yeah, I mean that's know. that's that's the critical that's the critical point. If you're going to allow stable coins with any potential runnability, then you run the risk this happens. So why don't we have runs on retail banks in the U.S. because they're insured? Now firms are not insured, corporate accounts are not insured, but retail. We haven't insured. had a bank run in 80 years. Yeah, we did. But are we going to do that with stable? 2008. Coins? We had it. We had that a wasn't bank. retail. That wasn't a retail. I didn't no, it see wasn't retail, banks. but it was it was a bank run. It was in the wholesale market. Correct. <laughs> it wasn't on the banks. Well, they were think. banks. They just weren't called yeah. banks by regulators. You have to take charge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they figured so out they were banks, a... which is why Goldman is now a bank. I have Charles Kahn from the panel who would like to ask a question. So, Charles, please go ahead. I've been enjoying the heat as much as the light. In the <laughs> but I, I, I just need something clarified. I'm not clear about the, the You guys are saying that retail is not important, but supply chain is important. I'm trying to figure out what the difference between the two is. What are you talking about with when you say supply chain, Gary? Okay, so let me give you an example. What, what is happening now in global supply chains? So global supply chains are going to blockchain. And the way it works is roughly as follows. I, I'm a shipper. I have a container. My container is registered as an NFT. It's on the blockchain. I go to Hyun and I say, you know, you take it the next step. And Hyun looks inside and says, okay, that's fine. And then a smart contract, so he accepts a smart contract, then changes the address of the NFT and it, it's registered to Hyun. And we go through the chain like that. Now, as soon as I get acceptance from Hyun that I did my part, a smart contract could pay me. Right, a smart contract would pay me, and the question is, what would they pay me with? Well, it, it's got to be something that's digital, right? It's got to be something that's digital, and the answer is either it's a stable coin or it's an NF or it's a central bank digital currency. Now, this whole blockchain world in global supply chains is not an abstraction. That's already happening. That's that's a widespread phenomenon. Right? Gary's right. 
And that's and so the question is in the global supply chains, which are already going to blockchain, what is the means of payment going to be? And right now that's a bit of a stumbling block. And you yeah, know, C. yeah, it could be CBDC, which I think would be the best thing, right? Because otherwise stable coins are going to take over and they're going to grow, and then we're going to have a big problem. So I don't even go to supply chains for uh, for you know realistic uses. Uh, one of the first experiments uh, that we did in our innovation hub was the payment versus delivery and payments versus payment. Um, so typically when, you know, when we have security settlement, uh, we have to wait a few days, uh, you know, clearing settlement with, um, with, uh, with a stable coin, uh, so, sorry, with, with a CBDC. Um, so one of the first experiments was, uh, uh, was, you know, within a single currency you can actually you know, program these things with CBDCs so that you can actually have the delivery um, triggered as soon as um, the payment is made and vice versa. So that, you know, these things happen at the same time. The supply chain example is a more elaborate one. And I agree with you that uh, you know, these are the examples uh, where the smart contracts, where these contingent um, uh, you know, execution of payments are probably you know, most, um, uh, you know, most promising. And, uh, you know, this is something that's already well known. And, and it's, already, has, it's already right. kind of pervasive. And by the way, that's where NFTs are also widely used. It's not, it's not as Chris said, for baseball cards. It's for tracking payments across uh, shipping across the globe. So just go back to the, an earlier point about could the dollar be supplanted? I think it, it's really the case that if, if there was a central bank or other or a stable coin that uh, was used for this purpose, it would easily be adopted. Charles, then, would you like to have a follow up? Yeah, yeah, but then, but then, I guess, uh, why hasn't the dollar already been supplanted by treasuries? If I were going to play this game, wouldn't I be just want to play you with? Uh, well, I'll give you a short-term treasury rather than paying you in dollars in the first place. Well, dollar uh, the short-term treasuries have supplanted dollars. I mean, the convenience yield on treasuries is much larger in dollar amounts than, you know, I mean, so if you track the convenience yield on cash versus the convenience yield on treasuries, which you can actually calculate, what happened was that the wholesale market became much more important starting about 30 or 40 years ago. The problem with global supply chains is you can't use treasuries really. Right. I mean, you can't pay with treasuries because there's all these interest calculations. I mean, you could do it with a smart contract. Come on, that's that, that's a silly that's a silly objection. If I'm doing all this other complicated stuff, I can certainly multiply. Well, the thing is that the other complicated stuff involves the technology. So, <laughs> and those guys can't multiply. You're you're kind of belittling the main point, Charlie, which is that global supply chains are already using blockchain. They're already using NFTs. The thing that they're not doing quite yet is paying, right? So rather than I ship my, I turn my container over to Hyun and then I send a, a bill to somebody, I could get paid right then. So Gary, I think we have to be careful um, uh, not to suggest that uh, the payment is taking place. Uh, you know, the blockchain to track uh, shipments across um, uh, supply chains. I mean, this is, you know, we know that blockchain is just a database. It's a distributed database uh, and it has this virtue that you don't need to, you know, trust anyone. You can actually have everything uh, that, uh, you know, everyone has identical copies of the, of the non database. Non-blockchain databases don't have smart contracts. No, of course, you know, um, uh, but, uh, but we should not give the impression that uh, the, the, the payments are already taking place uh, in those blockchains that are, you know, tracking shipments. There's no payments quite yet though, right? That's something people are working on, but as of now, there's no payments. So yeah, the payments to, uh, you know, wait for the development of these cross-border yeah. uh, EDC systems. Uh, and, but, but it's certainly, you know, uh, you know given uh, the uh, uh, successes that uh, has already been documented, uh, with security settlement, with uh, you know uh, payment versus delivery, these types of uh, you know contingent contracts, it can certainly be done. Uh, but the but up to now, the use of blockchain in supply chains has been mainly to keep track of shipments as a distributed. Hyun, Hyun, I understand that we're in early days. I'm telling you how it could likely develop. No, right? I'm not contradicting you, Gary. I'm just saying that you know we're in early days. 
Yeah, so we're, we're going to days. break off here. So we have another yeah. question by Dirk Niepelt. So Dirk. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. It's rather a comment, uh, not a question. So I, I agree that um, for the supply chain uh, payments, it would certainly be very beneficial to have CBDCs to make that easier. But right now, it seems to me that the trend is not going in that direction. So what I what I have recently looked at is both the white paper by the German banks that was issued a year ago, and then apparently there's also some new plans by the Japanese banking system. So what both of these have in mind, according to my understanding, is that they have bank-specific stable coins, essentially deposits on whatever kind of format they would be issued. And then the whole settlement between these guys in the end would be as complicated as it is today when the different deposit you know, payments across customers have to be settled. So they are apparently not expecting a CBDC to be available for that um, payment that would be consistent or according to the industry 4.0. So my question maybe to Katrin or to anybody from the ECB would be, is this a consequence of the fact that the digital euro, if it ever came to life, uh, is not really an instrument that could be used for the supply chain management because of the caps that would be imposed on that? Is this a killer, basically, for Industry 4.0, these kind of models? Thank you. <laughs> Catherine, I think that's, that one's for you, but I can come in after you. <laughs> I think I'm more here as a moderator rather than to okay. uh, report on the Digital Euro project, but... Um, <laughs> Just saying, well, uh, we are still investigating uh, the, the issues that arise from uh, monetary policy and financial stability perspective, which is something that we haven't touched so much upon in, in this round, but it's something which we probably can still discuss. But uh, the, the international use and the, the supply chain management is something that, I, in my view, would come second after having a, a digital euro then you can think about how to use it in international transactions because uh, I think it matches with what Yun said that first you need to have the central banks and setting up a system before you can think about how to make them interoperable. Although, of course, uh, you need when, when you talk about design, you also have to keep that in mind. But um, in the Digital Euro project, the main focus is clearly the, the um, intra euro area retail perspective. And you, and so you, you offer yeah. a Dirk, I think the uh, the example that you cite, I think it's you know we we do have uh, uh, you know digital um, uh, bank deposits. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, JP Morgan coin is a very good example. Uh, what are the possible advantages of having a JP Morgan coin versus correspondent banks? Well, I think one of the reasons that they rolled it out was because you can economize on the uh, um, on the um, you know uh, Nostra accounts. You don't need to have balances throughout the correspondent uh, banking chain for you to make those payments. Um, although, you know, there's a there's a debate about you know whether you're actually uh, achieving the uh, the economies in deposits because ultimately, if you have to issue them in New York, but then you're distributing them, presumably the deposits are in New York, you know, rather than uh, distributed throughout the you know th you know throughout the supply chain. But be that as it may. Uh, you know, I don't see anything you know particularly problematic about uh, a commercial bank, you know, issuing a digital version of its own deposits right. uh, for the for use in, in in this kind of supply chains. And uh, it's worth bearing in mind uh, that cross-border payments, you know, the origin of these things came from supply chains, um, as Gary rightly points out. You know, in in the in the 18th century or even before, bankers were you know bankers were also merchants. Uh, and hence merchant banker. Uh, and that was because payments and credit relationships were really two sides of the same coin and bills of exchange were used in the, the way. The issue with using digital deposits in the global supply chains goes back to our earlier dis brief discussion about deposit insurance, right? I mean, payments in global supply chains are gonna be large. They're gonna exceed the limit for deposit insurance. And so, you know, we go back to, you know, what happens if, you know, there's a, 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 pro, a run with that kind of stuff, right? I mean, because the global supply chains are not retail. The payments involved are, you know, hundreds of millions. So, yeah, it's wholesale. So it's as safe as any commercial bank deposit is. But I have another is, question uh, on uh, from Cyril Monet from the audience. So 
which is related to the financial stability concerns. So could the programmability of stable coins prevent financial stability concerns that have been raised? For example, the stable coin could stop convertibility after some threshold and commitment is not an issue because of the smart contract features. No, then the run would just happen earlier. We tried that with money market mutual funds, right? We said, oh, we'll put these gates in. Well, the run just happens earlier, right? So, you know, it, that, that's not going to work. And, it, and if you start programming things, then nobody's going to want it because they, they don't trust it, right? I mean, a central bank digital currency that has negative interest rates, nobody's going to want it. And yeah, I mean, I think going back, going back to the supply chain, I think it, what you're trying to get at is, I mean, we really do already have central bank digital currency in the U.S. It's called reserves yeah. of the banking system. And the way you'd want to do what Gary's suggesting is you want to tokenize. Banks would be able to tokenize their reserves. And then those tokens could be used across an Ethereum network or whatever. Yeah. And then it would get settled across central banks. So we've already got the object. All we're talking about is how do we take the object that's digital on the central bank's balance sheet and get it onto the Ethereum network, basically, yeah. or any of these chains. That's really the question. Yeah, I agree. We have another raised hand by Michael Lee. Michael? Yeah, so um, I, I have a question for Kian, kind of relating to uh, thinking about kind of the advantages of having a more parsimonious wholesale payment system that can be used for cross borders. Uh, well, one concern or aspect that I kind of think about is the potential for greater concentration in the financial system, even though in principle, we might think that the availability of a CBDC could allow for more decentralization. I mean, is this something that you have thought about? And um, I wonder if this could be a factor to consider when we're thinking about, you know, the, the, the costs and benefits of a CBDC. I think you're exactly right, Michael, by the way, hello. Um, the reason that there's so many stable coins is because it's a sort of tournament competition, right? I mean, not all of these coins are gonna survive. Um, and, you know, eventually there may be one or two. And I think that is a, a problem for financial stability. I mean, it's true in this whole space generally, right? I mean, there's 1500 blockchains, 250 DeFi's, you know, there used to be 483 automobile manufacturers in the U.S., and now we have three. So this whole space is, you know, experiments and failures and a tournament to see who's going to survive. I think with uh, uh, Michael on your question about uh, uh, about the architecture, uh, you know, I think the the way that uh, um, these experiments have been structured are in terms of. Uh, having a very, very simple structure where the commercial banks are the ordinary nodes in the network, the, um, the central banks are, if you like, the validating nodes. So that you, there's, one way I, there's one way of actually doing this, uh, you know, that, that has exactly that kind of structure. Um, but then you, you, would you would actually have a platform uh, where uh, a lot of the payment instruments are already pre-funded. So you need a pre-funding there to make sure that you know you have in, uh, you have uh, enough liquidity uh, in all the currencies involved, so that you can have the FX transaction um, uh, be implemented instantaneously as the you know as the payment is made. So I think on the on the concentration, you know, provided that you have the pre-funding, provided that you have uh, uh, the fact that you're transacting CBDCs and therefore there's no credit risk, uh, I think we can mitigate you know those kind of uh, uh, issues quite well. And what you're doing is you're really um, uh, making a huge advance relative to a system where you are stringing together many sequences of transactions across banks and where you're holding, uh, um, where, you know, where, where you need a, a padding of liquidity at every point in that system. So, so that- uh, does, does Tether's reserves count as pre-funding? Um, Tether's reserves, reserves. would not be funding, Gary. Yeah, because you know um, uh, what I'm talking about are not stable coins. What I'm talking about are transactions in central bank digital currencies, right? So I these are. I think you should talk about stable coins because that's the competition. Yeah, but uh, that's not the system that I'm talking about, Gary. So, so I know you're, you're leapfrogging over stable coins. 
thought the CBDC network would work. I'm not talking about stable coins. I know, you're way off in the mists of the future. No, 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 this is actually happening. <laughs> this is actually happening. I mean, Catherine, I mean, uh, I do have a slide on this, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring it up. <laughs> so we are almost running out of time and there are still a lot of questions. So I, I would like to go to a completely different topic. So, and maybe this is the question for, for Chris. There have been a few questions which I, which I summarize is that might either CBDCs or stable coins change the Fed's ability to implement monetary policy, either for good or bad? Yeah, I mean, I guess if we go back to this idea that these stable coins peg themselves to the dollar, then we know just from any international finance, any country that pegs an exchange rate, they import US monetary policy, yeah. right? And that's true with the banks. The banks peg their commercial bank money to the dollar. So anything that we do or we make decisions, it gets transmitted through that. So stable coins pegged to the dollar, even if it might be loose in the sense of tether, if they try to somehow maintain that, they're just amplifying US policy. They're not diminishing it at all. But um, digital um, dollarization would raise seniorage for, for the Fed. So if um, foreign countries adopt uh, the dollar this would yeah i mean like, like, like you said, for the Fed. so would you count this as a benefit how how to disentangle costs and benefits from from that perspective yeah so i just let's leave aside the run aspect financial stability of stable coins i'm just simply trying to point out that any stable coin that's pegged to the dollar is going to amplify u.s monetary policy it's not going to diminish it. just like dollarization and other economies. yes exactly it's dollarization so I think, Catherine, I think when we when we talk about CBDCs and, and monetary policy implementation, I think clearly that, uh, you know, the answer depends on the design of the CBDC. Uh, now, some people have raised uh, possibilities of uh, interest bearing CBDCs, uh, but I think it would be fair to say that the central case that most um, of the dis uh, of the discussion has has revolved around uh, has been uh, just a digital form of cash, so non interest bearing. So it's there for, uh, for you know, very much to oil the wheels of the payment system uh, rather than for these other flourishes uh, to do with uh, monetary policy implementation. Okay, thank you. So, and there is a final question, which goes back to the regulation issue. And um, so it's from Francisco Rivadeneira to Gary. Why would regulation of the new forms of money be inferior to the issuance of the CBDC? So um, I understood you that um, you're saying regulation is not as good as having a CBDC, so we should be prepared to issue a CBDC. Well, that's the question that we posed 100 years ago, right? Why do we want to have a central bank monopoly of money? And I think part of the answer is that, you know, you can't regulate everything because things seep through the cracks. I mean, remember in 2007, 2008, there was a $10 trillion shadow banking system, which nobody happened to notice. So I think, I think a, a central bank digital currency can't eliminate those vul vulnerabilities. But I think what countries decided was that it's the best way to mitigate those kind of vulnerabilities. Right. So if we could, you know, use central bank digital currency instead of stable coins, we might be able to avoid a crisis with stable coins. I mean, again, this is very forward looking, right? Right now, stable coins can't be used for very much at all. So we're talking about developments in 10 years. But I think the scary part is the you know, Financial Times published a little bar graph of the amount of money spent on lobbying by stable coin issuers. And it's already, you know, kind of amazing. And you know, they, they, they're already kind of anticipating us and they're ahead of us. Then how do we know that we got the answer right 100 years ago? Well, I think, I think we can wait 10 years and we can reconvince you in the next financial crisis. If you can't learn from history, we'll just repeat it. And then you can learn, how's that? We did that in 2007, 2008, we can do it again. So Catherine, I think, um, uh, when we, when we think about the question of this panel, which is, should central banks issue CBDCs? Um, uh, I think the answer comes in, in two parts. If you don't have a well-functioning 
retail fast payment system that has all the you know uh, uh, documented benefits, then that is the low hanging fruit. And that's where you should go first. Having said that, if you already have such a system, uh, be aware that uh, the extra step to going to a CBDC, a retail CBDC, uh, is not that great. So the only difference, um, so you, you already have a digital ID system, you have the API that ensure uh, privacy and interoperability. The only difference would be that uh, you would have, rather than having transactions on commercial bank deposits, the commercial banks would be there operating wallets on behalf of their customers. So that will be the only difference. And I think um, when we put it in those terms, the difference is not really between CBDC and the current system. I think the big debates and the biggest welfare gains will come when we actually go to the top of the range retail fast payment systems. And that's the, and, and, uh, and the case in Brazil is actually a very, very interesting case of this. CBDCs is just another small step on top of that. And you know, would you want to go there? In my view, yes, because there are additional benefits. Uh, these international um, applications, these programmability, you know, this, uh, this payment versus uh, delivery and so on. And in any case, we have to formulate policy with a view on uh, by anticipating possible developments, not simply standing where we are and looking back and saying, do we need it right now as things stand? That is not the right question in my view. The, the right question is, given what the other possible technological developments might be in the next 10, 20 years, what is the best way of actually our heading that off and having a system that would be you know, fit for purpose for that case? Thank you, Hyun. I think we all agree on that, that we should be forward looking and um, the time is up. So I'm sorry that I have to close now. And I would like to thank all of you for the very lively and very engaged discussion. So um, it was a pleasure to moderate this discussion. And with that, I would like to uh, hand back to Jonathan. Yep. Um, thank you again to Katrin, um, Chris, Gary, Hume for the very uh, active and thought provoking discussion and to all of you for participating today. We hope you will join us again next month on April 22nd when Antoine Martin will talk about uh, optimal design of tokenized market. And um, Zigua He will discuss the paper and uh, Wilco Boat will moderate the session. Until then, I hope you have a pleasant day and a nice weekend. See you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all.